these are going to be the paints that we can't live without. And the reason we say that is these are paints that fill a specific use case that maybe could not be used by another paint. To condense it down, you're going to get five for the price of two. Five for the price of two. Everyone knows that classic saying. The old metallics, they are like silk. The microflakes in them are tiny. I'm not exaggerating with that. Like putting this on over a blend is nuts. This thing is like uh, a bright white searchlight on the on the horizon. It's so it's so <laughs> it's so it's so vibrant. We're down another member. The numbers are fluctuating like crazy of late. I know, holiday all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone that thinks of travel agents. Yeah. But um Well, Joe's gone. Yeah, yeah. And we done the whole Blood Angels free episode. Mm -hmm. But this is just the Blood Angels episode now. We're in control. <laughs> <laughs> we finally got rid of him. <laughs> yeah. Finally excommunicated that dark angel from the codex. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. So we can we can flap our gums about Blood Angels till the cows come home. So yeah. Christmas boxes? Uh, Christmas boxes, yeah. Good ones. Uh, I'm very excited. As I think anybody who likes uh, Assault Marines uh, has seen the uh, Marine one and is uh, super, super excited at, at that. It's all um, new stuff as well, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, it's really good. I, I think it's actually quite good. That I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the first one that has got a Primark in it. Uh, no, they've done Primarks before. They've done like Mortarian and that before. What, in a Christmas box? Yeah. Did they? Pretty sure they've done like Mortarian last year. And oh, well, right, because I, I genuinely thought when I saw the corn, I was like, oh, wow, they put a Primark in it. I genuinely thought that they'd, that they'd, um, that this was the first time that no, they'd. No, I think there's precedent for that, but uh, they're pretty cool boxes, though. Yeah. Marines, um, probably more of the one, the blander ones for me, but it's obviously taken your fancy as a Blood Angels, uh, Blood Angels boy. Yeah. I'm very keen on getting myself 15 jump, jump assault intercessors with jump packs and, yeah. In. I don't know what they call yeah, it. Well, <laughs> assault Marines. <laughs> yeah, Assault Marines. Yeah, very keen. Uh, very keen on that. Um, yeah, so that will be good. What are you going to do with the second captain? Um, oh, that's a good one. I might I might just, because I'm going to make some new Death Company, uh, I might just use that model as like a, as a Death Company model. Just in a leaping pose. And, I, and what I also am going to do is I'm going to switch, I'm going to half and half boxes. So I'm going to do like half Assault Incessors with the jump packs and half, with the with the landing legs so the units are varied so it looks like okay. you've got ones that are running ones that are landed ones that are like so yeah so the captain on the or the extra captain body on the flying base will um will 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 fit in fit in really well like a glove in the words of jim carrey so <laughs> so uh so yeah he'll be good um yeah so that's that's my plan i'm actually quite excited by the uh the guard one i was gonna say the guard one i'm glad you said that yeah yeah, that's good, isn't it? Twenty-five infantry and two massive tanks. Two tanks, yeah. It's the two tanks, not one, but <laughs> you two. Can't, you can't go, can't go wrong, can't go wrong with that. And again, newer tanks, the Rogal Dawns. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good little set. The Orc one's pretty cool, pretty funny. Got lots of lots yep. of. Uh, they lots got of... a kill rig in a Christmas box. Well, I was surprised. That's a massive put, kit. I, I was surprised they put anger on in a Christmas box. I, I genuinely, I noticed that again, but I genuinely thought that you that this this was the first time they'd done it because I was like, wow, that's awesome. And looking at the Tyranny's one, you've got the Norn Emissary as well, which is, yeah, again, a new model, model and a massive that, model. That model's incredible, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's pretty good. Is that a Votan one as well? It is a Votan one, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Votan one's pretty cool. Again, you've got two, uh, you've got Hecaton Land Fortress, haven't you? Um, and then you've got the little Sagittar as well. So again, all the all the heavy infantry as well in that one, which is quite good. So yeah, yeah it's a good box. I think I always like the Christmas boxes. I think because they cause you get a nice variation of models and, and a lot of the time you'll always find use for them as well. So... So yeah, they're quite, they're really good. Use for them like you need more Space Marines in your life, James. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Is this going to be the start of your uh, your Blood Angels primary? I've thing? already got, I've already got four boxes of Assault Incessors ready to go. I've got the Captain, obviously. Four which, boxes? Yeah. And you're all, adding three boxes? How much infantry do you need? I'm going all infantry. All infantry? All infantry, yeah. No no dreads? No tanks. Oh yeah, we'll have a few dreads, yeah. A few Redemptors just to, uh, see, I'm holding out for the Redemptor because I'm really hoping that we get some flavoured Redemptor Dreadnoughts down the line. That's the thing I'm really looking forward to. Um, there's nothing that's tastier than a Death Company, Death Company Redemptor Dreadnought. I wonder if they'll just do like an upgrade sprue for it, like they do for the normal Primaris Marines. See, I think they've been very, very clever with the design of that kit because a lot of the armour panels are separate, like the mm. shoulders, uh, the kneecaps and things like that. So I think that you could easily get some sculpted pads, some like that just clip on. I think that'd be quite cool. Um, and, the sock, and, the, and that lifting plate, the front plate that just lifts up. You've got yeah, the sarcophagus. Yeah. That bit as well being separate is is screaming to have some chapter specific parts. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. I don't know if disappointed is the word I'd use for Space Marines, but I feel like this is like, I don't want to say bland. Like if you, if you're 
into the new assault marines, then it's definitely for you. But if you're not, then it's definitely not for you. you know no, what I mean? no, potentially. So, so here's a question. You're just getting into 40K. Mm. You've gone down your local club or you've been introduced to it or someone's bought your model or whatever, blah, blah. You, Christmas is coming. Mm -hmm. So everyone's excited. Christmas, candy canes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and um, you've got to choose one of those. Which one are you going for? What's your, what's your, what's your parents, parents hard earned cash going on? I think guard is the coolest in terms of like aesthetic I like. However, in terms of what's most realistic in my life that I would ever actually get finished would definitely be the corn. Because yeah, cool. uh, you've got, I like, do you know why I like that one? It's quite balanced because you've got one massive model that you can like go all out on, but then there's not that much else in the box. Like it's not, it's, it's not waves and waves of infantry. Like there's only 17 models in there. So you've yeah. only got, you've only got a handful of like, of troops to paint. It's yeah. not like you're going to be sitting there. I mean, if you pick the Tyranids one, I mean, you're going to be batch painting for, it's 34 for a long old time. It's nearly double. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a lot of models. Um, and the guard one's a lot as well. It's 27. Yeah. That's a lot of models in there. I'm still going Marines. Still going Marines. <laughs> yeah. Straight down the middle. Straight down the middle. Yeah. Don't know yeah. Actually, no, to be fair, the Votan, the Votan's quite good. I do actually like it. Um, and I, and for me as well, adding some more Votan to, to the orange army I've got would be quite cool. It's a good box. because I've got you done those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got, I've got, um, I've got a couple of, of I've got a Hecatan, I've got a Sagittar, I've got two Sagittars, but I haven't, I haven't painted them yet. But um, the big infantry, I'm, I'm a big, big, big fan of those. They look great. So, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's probably, probably my, my Christmas choice if I was, if I was, uh, wet behind the ears when it comes to 40 gay. <laughs> so yeah. I, I didn't pick orcs, uh, even though we're Oct October is among us. Yeah. Well, I say among us, it's like, it's like we've got six oh, days, well, seven days left. That's right? what I was going to say. Yeah, so you know, I've same. decided a bit, probably a bit too late, but I've decided, uh, the October bug has finally hit me. I spoke about this with Joe, uh, a are few you, weeks Are ago. you going to get it done in time though? I'm going to start it in time. You sound like me. It. You I sound like it. me. Yeah. So I bought, we had a, we had a commission in for some of the, well, we've had a couple of commissions through actually that I've done media for, for the Orc Commandos box. And Gaz as well. And I Gaz. painted Gaz as well Gaz. a couple of months back. Big man. But uh, seeing those commandos uh, really tickled me. So I bought, uh, bought a box of them. Well, and you got, are you do, painting one of them? I'm just going to paint the knob like as a display model. It's a great model. So I've got him, got him plinthed up. Great model. Uh, as is tradition. Uh-huh. Let you know so, I get on. I'm not sure if I'll have it done. I, time, I absolutely but. love the commandos. I think they're phenomenal. Like the the bomb squig is just such a cool little model. Um, and the, well, it's a little like commando grot. It's like the best. It's, it's such a cheeky little model. It's just really really cool. They're just so like varied as well. Like, yeah, it's, like, they it's are. like they're not quite characters, but like it's not like just a box where like all the models are the same. If you know what I mean, either. No, exactly. It's kind of like treading a nice middle ground. Yeah, no, they are good. I I, I would have loved to have had something done for October. I've got a uh, start collecting orc box with the uh, war boss with the grot in the little sort of mm -hmm. pirate pirate turret thing that, like, you know, um, um, I've always wanted to paint that model. So that, that might be my Christmas, Christmas chill model. I think like, Christmas chill model. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, is that a thing? I just said it. I guess it is. Yeah. Tonight. Tell yeah. us what your Christmas chill you know model I mean? is going to yeah. be in the comments. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to basically spend Christmas when I'm not, um, watching the same films on TV, like every other year. Um, painting, probably going to paint the orc, I think from that, the orc boss from that kick. So I, I absolutely love it. I think it's a fun, it's really, really cool. Have um, you painted many orcs? Yeah, I did. I had an orc army back in the day. So I had, a, I had like a, a what big, do I ask? Yeah. About every army. Loads of mega knobs and mega armor, um, and trucks. And they used to just jump out and just, just, crunch stuff um but uh but yeah i just really fancy and i actually had a death skulls army many 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 moons ago that had loads of conversion in it with like loads of imperial weapons and things like that so it'll either be uh a classic goth orc war boss or i'll probably go death skulls and just try and convert it maybe give the grot like an imperial stubber or something like that so it's a bit different but but yeah that's my thought process i just want to do something a little bit different with it i just fancied Little painting project for the Christmas. Super late for October. I'm never going to get it done in time, obviously. So I'm not even going to throw myself into that gauntlet. Um, yeah, pretty much. It. I saw, uh, speaking of October, uh, if we go into the, uh, the listeners' comments, me and Joe spoke about uh, on the episode that we did, uh, just us two. And we said, like, why are there not other months? So, like, you've got March from a crag and they've got October. Yeah. We was like, what about some other months? And uh, Kerry Little 2951 says, uh, Dark Angels December. Christmas has angels and a long-haired bearded guy who died and came back to life. That's fair. That's fitting. It's fitting. That's so, fair. Uh, we'll have to come up with some more of them. Yeah, That's a good one though. Yeah, then I'm just trying to think of a one off the cuff, but I can't. No, but uh, there's a Jamesism in there. Somewhere. There was one somewhere, but I, 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 that one's going to take a bit of a time to brew. Yeah, yeah, like Should a good stew. There you go. Um, uh, <laughs> let's, do, let's do some more of these. Uh, Pete Wilco says, 
Uh, you've given me thoughts on re-evaluating rattle cans. Uh, but weather in the British Isles can be fairly humid at times. Yes, it can. Uh, are there any times of year here that you found in practice rattle cans don't really work, uh, bearing in mind the current storms and rain? Ooh, um, I mean, obviously, if it's raining, yeah, not happening. Yeah. That is the massive advantage of the airbrush in that regard of, yeah, you're indoors. So weather is not really... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes, like, like I don't sound silly, but... Um, like for example, one in my old house, like the kitchen was very cold. Uh, it's like an extension, so like certain parts of the house could be, I don't sound silly, but it could be colder than others. Typically, I'd always store the cans in a warmer place, a warm part of the house. I mean, we spoke um, about the hobby hack of obviously uh, in a previous episode. You can yeah. heat the cans up, yeah, uh, yeah, using warm water. But it, I've found generally that like if you're doing that, if you're only going outside for like a brief moment to spray, it don't get me wrong, like it's not ideal and you can still have problems. But if you're warming the can up in some water and you're going outside, providing it's not like hammering down with snow or rain. Yeah, yeah. Even if it is cold, if you're spraying the models, if you're out there and you're, you know, time's of the essence, if you're quick, you're not, you know, wasting time hanging around and you bring the models inside to dry. I've generally had like reasonable success. I've not really had any catastrophes that I can think of. That's that's why I'm, I've been known to frequent the garden with a massive extension lead and a hairdryer before. So you use the hairdryer outside. Yeah, Do you when not bring them in first. No, when it's, if it's snowing, I'm I'm using I'm getting that spray on the can. Like you try and spray a spray can, even if it's well shaken. You go outside to temperature drop from at, when it atomizes to hitting the model. It, it, it happens pretty quick, especially when it's really cold. I mean. Well, think, yeah. think about when you're breathing. So when you breathe yeah, in winter, you can see your breath. Yeah. So your hot, warm breath is co super cooling really quickly as it exits the as it exits the mouth, and it's obviously that's what because of the temperature difference in obviously the air that's inside you to what's outside. We've entered James's science corner. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah. So if I've really been desperate to to undercoat a model during winter, um, then yeah, I'll be I'll get an extension lead out with a hairdryer in the garden spray dry spray dry spray I mean if it's that cold I'm going to sit there with my warm fuzzy slippers on and I'm going to use the airbrush but you know to each their own yeah you know you've got to you've got to got to muscle up on those uh, those undercoating was sessions it, was it uh, improvise adapt overcome yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kate Bedlam says in regards to uh, you saying about how many water pots you use for cleaning brushes says uh, three water pots just triples the chance that I'll drink from one yeah there is that yeah <laughs> there is that, that as well just, you ever done uh, that I, do you know what? I never have. I've never done that. I've never have. Do you know what I have done? I've had a coffee, my coffee mug next to my water pot and I've not been looking and I've dipped my paintbrush I've, and I've rinsed done in my coffee. I've, I've done that before. I've done that many a time, but I have never, ever... Um, I'm worried that I've it. done that and not noticed that I've done that and then drank the coffee. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I can understand why, especially if you've got like a tea and you're using maybe like, I don't know, like uh, Van Brown or something like that, yeah. maybe, or coffee. Oh yeah, I can understand that definitely. But um, but yeah, no, I haven't. No, touch wood. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, Minicraft says, if I wanted to level up, would it be better to do 10 or 20 tabletop standard minis or really push my limits on one? Uh, I'm presuming in this scenario that they're spending the same amount of time regardless. Yeah, I, I, I don't see any disparity between the two. They're both different exercises. One is about consistency and process and the other one is about focus and attention and consistent quality. Um, like batch painting 20 models is a, is a hard task in itself, especially if you're trying to paint them to a high standard. Um, doing a character individually and focusing on it and putting as much effort as you can into it is a task in itself. I don't know that they're necessarily batch painting them out either because they've said tabletop standard. So do they mean w just the practice of doing it? Like even if you're doing them one by one, right? Of like, I'm going to paint oh, the okay. same thing over and over and over again to like a mid-level standard. Potentially. I, I see. I was reading that. I was literally reading that as like, I'm painting 20 models in a batch. Yeah. I mean, it could um, go either way. Um, I don't really think that's a right or wrong there. I think, like you said, you're just sort of exercising different muscles really in that it scenario. It is. They're, they're different different horses for different courses they're literally yeah. like you know one's going to teach you focus attention and, and real sort of like refining those really sort of like little details and bits and bobs on the models and really pushing yourself to make that because it's a character you know you want to make it look better than maybe your rank and file or whatever um the the batch painting will teach you repetition and consistency it depends what your output is as well because like if you're someone who's just wanting to paint armies then batch painting is probably more important for you because at the end of the day people aren't looking at your one character up close they're looking at your army as a whole so that's probably going to be something that improving on is going to have better output for you. But that being said, if you just want to paint display models and you want to put nice stuff in a cabinet, then batch painting a big squad of models isn't really going to help you either because you're like they're well, they're kind of different things in my mind. Yes and no. I mean, person, the thing is, you could get five models, like maybe buy a, a box of like more elite infantry, like for, uh, orc knobs, assault marines, or whatever it is, blah blah, and you could try and paint the unit 
like a character individually, each of them, but in a batch. And that's combining both of those things then. So you will be leveling up because you'll be pushing yourself harder. And whilst trying to maintain the consistency of that, pushing yourself harder across five rather than one. Um, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at either of those exercises as a right or wrong or better or worse. I'd just go, they're different things for different skill sets and to push myself in different directions. That's that's kind of how I would look at it. I think at the end of the day as well, as long as you're doing something, like you're going to get better. Like yeah, of course, time on yeah. the brushes is time on the brushes. And Amen. fair yeah. enough, there are more efficient ways you can go about that. But the more time you sit and thinking about trying to like hyper efficient and min max like your output on, yeah. on your hobby time, like the more time you're spending thinking about doing it rather than doing it is more of a waste to me uh, i'd much rather you just sat and did one of those two things rather than procrastinate and try and worry uh, yeah. about which one's right or wrong exactly yeah 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 it really is just a quick one wanted to let you know that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at siege studios we offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience you can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk and just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% of your first commission with us here at Siege using the code PAINT5. Now back to the show. So our topic for this week was going to be some more paints, as the viewers know, from clicking on this episode. When we discussed this yesterday, James, I said, should we do like another five paints each? I kind of would know. You've got a lot more than five. Yeah. See, I, I've tried to offer quite a lot of value in this in this one. I know we said a specific number. Value. <laughs> yeah, I know we said a specific value, and I'm going to caveat this right away with that, uh, like, I understand that I have a certain vintage to some of my paints and that's not easily accessible to everybody. And I understand that because I've had messages from people saying, oh, like you mentioned this color, blah, blah, blah. I can't, it's hard to get or I can't get it. What color would you recommend instead? It's close to it, whatever. So with that in mind- I was fully expecting you to rock up with like a case of vintage paint. And in fairness, you have not done no, that. No, I've not. I've, do you know what? I've, but I've, you have instead shown up with a case of paint rather than five Yeah, paints. I did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought what I thought would be really good would be to show you some ones that I really like and really mm -hmm. think are great. Um, and then in in sort of like if, if, if you try to get them or whatever, maybe if you don't find them, they're a really good sign of a kind of alternative. So so um, so that's kind of like what I've tried to do with with uh, with the ones that I've chosen. Um, um, so just for the listeners, these are going to be the paints that we can't live without. And the reason we say that is these are paints that fill a specific use case that yeah. maybe could not be used by another paint. It's not a... I really like this color because it's my favorite color. It's I really like this paint because it has great coverage or I like this paint because it's good for this one specific application. Or as a technical benefit. So exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So go on then. What's, what's your first one? Oh, God, do you know what? Like, I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. I don't know which one to pick <laughs> first. Um, do you know what? I think we're going to go with, uh, uh, let's go with uh, the wash to start off with. So um I don't really use a lot of uh, this brand or manufacturer's paints, being honest. It's just not, then it's, you know what I've I grew up on Citadel, so um, the first one is going to be uh, the Army Painter Quick Shade Strong Tone. That's the first one. Now um, I do use the Citadel one, so I do use like uh, Sepia, Reichland, etc., etc., etc. But um, I was kind of pointing in the direction of this one when uh, I was looking for something just a it kind of like a little bit more viscous and a little bit more sort of like the, it's not as strong as as Agrax but it's a little bit more diluted than that in the way it covers and the way it tones. Ironic that it's called strong tone. It is, it is called strong tone yeah but like when you compare this to like Agrax I don't I don't really find it like um, I find with, with this you can you can use it and it and it really does give a nice desaturated look to certain colours when you put it over the top um, and whereas Agrax does does tone dark to an extent, um, I think you can put a thinner layer of this on. And it just it it does push the contrast a little bit more. I think sometimes, uh, and that's depending obviously what color you put it over the top of. But yeah, I, I, it's literally one of the only paints I think I use for my painter, um, uh, and that's not through sort of not not sort of wanting to use a range or anything. It's just it's just I got sort of like pointed in its direction quite a, quite a while ago. Tried a bit for a certain, for a couple of bits and bobs. Really liked it, and then just have always grabbed it as and when I wanted to do a certain thing when I was painting. Um, I, I assume that the, the I think there's a red tone. And, and there's uh, so like, many washes. Yeah, there's I, 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 I'm a painter of a massive wash range. Yeah, I, I, I've I've always I'm, I've always been Citadel through and through from when I started. Obviously, um, so I've been really familiar with all the Citadel washes and stuff. So, but that's one of the only ones I've used. I think that's one of the ones that Joe spoke about, where he was like, when he first started painting, it was the uh, use it for everything, and it would just make it, make it look better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I think that they came after. So when this is my knowledge of iron painting, but when when they first released their, like, their quick dip kind of thing, mm. these came very very after that. I believe all their washes they developed all their wash range after that. But again. 
again, I could be wrong. I'm not massively knowledgeable on, on Army Painter as a range and as, as a company, but um, but um, but yeah, like I I I do use it as as and when when I need something a little bit that's got just finishes and looks a little bit different than maybe Agrax or Reichland, for example. But yeah, that's I tend to use it a fair amount. I use them for uh, some bolt action minis. Okay, which I actually thought that was brilliant for. Oh yeah, I think they're suited to that. Yeah, I haven't really. I don't think I've used them on much 40k stuff at all, really. But for something in that sort of setting, especially for terrain, yeah, like especially if if you're one of those people who's like concerned about price and things as well, yeah, like yeah, getting yeah. one of those bottles and just slapping it like over your terrain or, or even like ground cover like texture. If you're one of those people who puts like sand on your base and whatnot, I, I've I've put it for an airbrush as well. Oh, yeah. uh, it's really good the airbrush, like really really good. A lot of like washes. You think and it's stuff like, like a tint? Yeah, or? yeah, like a tint just to desaturate so stuff. If you don't want it like because obviously when you put it on with a brush, you put on quite a bit on the model, mm-hmm. um, and it does change the tone of the of the piece quite massively but if you just give it a small little subtle pass with the airbrush it will just it'll give you in, more incremental changes in tone which is quite good um see so yeah, i've used it for the airbrush as well on some tanks and things which has been quite good uh, but yes that's that's i think people overlook like using them on bigger surfaces like massively yeah d- definitely i do agree i think that you, you, you know, i mean i'm not one for like putting washes over big flat surfaces that's a bit of a pet peeve of mine but yeah. like like I said, terrain. Well, with the like airbrush, you can, effects. and it doesn't do the pooling. That's the yeah. thing I'm saying. You put it through the airbrush, it atomizes it, and then it allows you to put like that tint filter over the whole entire thing. So you get no brush marks, but it gives you a real soft kind of tonal variance to the, to the surface and just changes the tone. Do you find that using a wash for that behaves different than using an ink for that? Uh, it depends. Some inks can look quite shiny once they go on through the airbrush. Mm. They've got quite a lot. They've got quite a lot of, I don't know if it's like, gloss varnish but they have, they have quite a lot of gloss sort of like finished property to them um whereas i find that that and all the citadel ones are quite matte when they go through the airbrush um it's like contrast like when you put contrast on they they tend to be quite matte i genuinely never thought of that because i've used yeah. a lot of inks before through the airbrush they're really the shine good. is they, the shine is a concern w- washes through the airbrush is phenomenal you should especially on metallics because the thing is like let's just say you're doing a night like when i done my nights for example I had the I had the, the all the exoskeletons all separate to the armor panels and I'd painted them obviously I'd rattle canned them all the silvers I'd done two silvers so I'd done like a silver all over and then like a, a forty five mid forty five to ninety for with like a brighter silver and um, the the brighter silver was quite strong so so I just literally was like right well I want to tone it all down if I get a brush and put like null oil or whatever all over it it's just gonna gonna leave loads of tie marks pull marks etc 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 so um, so so what I decided to do is literally just put put the different shades I use through the airbrush and um and, and it really gives you a lovely soft uh sort of tinting of the metalwork, but it's not nowhere near as strong as when you just put it on with a brush, obviously. It just works really well. So yeah, I'd consider putting the washes through we'll the airbrush. It's yeah. really good. Okay. Well speaking of inks, uh I'll fire off with my first one then. Uh that's Liquitex Napthol Crimson. I've seen a lot of those. They're quite good. I like the Liquitex inks. I think a lot of people like the, the Liquitex inks. They're great, yeah. I know uh, these and like the Dollar Rowney ones, I think are probably the most popular. Yeah. Um, this is, anyone who's been following me for a while, this is the OG of my uh, my Blood Angels recipe. Uh, I remember you telling me this. Yeah. yeah. So my old school quick and dirty uh, methodology was the classic white. spray the whole <laughs> spray the whole model black, <laughs> do the white volumetric highlighting with the airbrush. Yeah. And then this is super transparent. It's got more punch than Rocky Balboa. It's really transparent, so it goes over the black and it doesn't really do anything. When it goes over the white, the great. vibrancy is... It's really good. Not quite blood red, James, don't get me wrong, but it's sort of a different like no, colour anyway. No Ray-Bans with that one. No yeah. Ray-Bans with that one. Yeah, yeah no. Um, inks as well. Like I've started to try and dip my toe into a bit more with like brushwork, like just glazing them in. Yeah, they're great. Um, I, I use a lot of the old Citadel black ink, brown ink, um, chestnut ink uh, or metals and stuff like that, like oil and grime and stuff like that. And because they do finish, like I mentioned, uh, a bit glossier, works really well, um, works really well on metals, but they are phenomenal for adding tint colors onto things. Uh, like you literally get a tiny, tiny little bit of that on a palette, add water into it, and you've got the most amazing glaze that you can exactly. use on that. Yeah. And if anyone's not used inks before, like one of the amazing things with using inks instead of just normal acrylics that is the, the key selling point is they don't like stain over yeah. surfaces. Yeah, yeah exactly. So if you've got a color and you're adding you're adding like a filter layer mm-hmm. if you've got like black and then white and then you glaze like a, a red acrylic over it you're going to end up with that distinct difference and yeah. you're going to end up with a finished difference if you do it with an ink it's literally just a filter over the whole top it's it transparent like to the nth degree you, you got to be careful with them though they obviously come with a really good applicator as well so you can like a bit a bit more like a, a little, pipette, pipette, yeah, a little squeezy yeah. they're really good they're really good for that but the the, the other thing as well is like you've got to be careful with them because they do stain like if you dro- i've dropped one of those on a carpet before it's not a good day. <laughs> it's 
it's not a good day. <laughs> I've actually, uh, because it's such a big lid, I've actually spilled uh, a yeah. few of these. Yeah, you, you think you've got problems with the null oil, the null oil being tipped over. You're, you're having a holiday compared to dropping that on the floor. Yeah. One of the downsides, I will say, because uh, they go on so thin with the airbrush, mm. they are easy to chip off. So normally what I would do is as soon as I've airbrushed them on, and they also take a while to dry. Yeah, they do. So it's one of those things where they're quick to do and they're quick to use, but the the downside is it's, it's not really time you're doing anything, but it's like a leave it overnight sort of yeah, situation. Yeah. Yeah. So when I would do my blood angels, for example, spray the whole models black, do the zenith all, spray them with the ink, and then they're getting left until the next day. Then they're getting varnished. Varnish, then you've got to wait yeah. for the varnish to say, dry. With inks and stuff like that, I, felt, I find that even though they're really, they've got loads of punch and saturation and color, depending on which one you're using, obviously. But but the um, they do come off quite easy if you're careful, if you're not careful. So yeah, varnish them in once they're, once they're fully dry. Uh, and then, yeah, you're right, leave them over 24 hours. And they're very, very shiny. And if yeah. you're going to varnish them and you don't want them to be shiny anymore... <laughs> Look at that segue. It's like I queued it up. It's like I've done it on purpose. It's like, it's like you planned for this. It's like George. I planned for yeah. this one. Yeah. I've got here uh, AK Interactive's uh, Ultra Matte Varnish. That's great. This stuff yeah. is absolutely yeah. mental. You know when people always talk about like, oh, this was like a game changer for me. And like someone always says that and like, you kind of like disregard it, right? Because it is good. This, this is like the first hobby product in a long old time. Probably since I like discovered washes that actually like blew my mind like and i'm I, i'm not exaggerating with that like putting this on over a blend is nuts what it does for the finish yeah i, I do like it a lot i think it ha it sometimes can be a bit strong personally it's yeah it's called ultra yeah. matte for a reason yeah like, it's it very matte. very very matte um i have tried it and i've got it i've used it i actually used it on my nights um on the sort of like because i use mr hobby which is obviously that uh, is mr hobby mr hobby bringing it up again but yeah um because obviously that's a uh, totally different it's not an acrylic paint the what i used it had such a what is it like an enamel it's an enamel yeah or it's not enamel it's like it's the same as like a uh, tamiya paints right okay. tamiya clears and things like that it's got a lot of it's got it's just very shiny when it goes on first um so to, to, to bring it back down, it was great for putting transfers on, obviously, because when I gloss varnished it, it was still really shiny. But then to to, to to put that over the top, it really does help just obviously just keep the saturation of color. But at the same time, it just gives you a lovely matte finish. Um, I have also used, on a little bit of a segue, uh, the Vallejo Mecca range, mm. which is very similar in the sense of its potency and strength of of, of matte finish. The Mecca matte is, is just like that. As well. My gripe with the Vallejo not, varnishes is oh, I'm always faffing around with them to get them the right consistency in my airbrush. Yeah. This out of the bottle is Oh, it's perfect. great. It's great out of the bottle. Yeah, obviously. That's a pre-airbrush designed uh, varnish. Generally speaking, like a 50-50 is, is about right for, for most varnishes with airbrush thinner. It can be, but like, you know, if you let it sit in there, the thinner separates, it can be a bit, yeah, no, bit marish yeah, at times. No, I, I get that. Yeah. It's also just like extra time. Do you know what I mean? It is, yeah. Yeah. Especially if what I, what my favorite use case for this for is it's not putting over a whole model. My favorite thing for this is when you've been blending on like say a cape for example on like a marine. Yeah. When you build up layer after layer of glazing, yeah. you end up with a lot of shine, mm -hmm. and that that refraction of light stops you from seeing the smoothness of the blend. Yeah, it does. And I like using this just selectively, not not to its full opacity to like super 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 flatten it. Yeah, yeah. But putting some of this over the top of that just instantly reveals like one how smooth the blend is. And two, that can that can do one of two things. It gives you a better finish, like on finish result, or it can also help you to see mistakes that you didn't realize were there. Mm. But using it selectively is perfect for that. And because it's pre-thinned and it's just the right consistency out of the bottle, I can just put like two drops of this in my airbrush, spray it on the cape, call it done. Yeah, it is good. I, I really do rate it. The Mecca one as well is actually is, is awesome. But that, I think, because of the ease of using it straight at the bottle, we don't have to thin it or anything like that. I think it is... It trumps it a little bit, I think. Is the Mecca like you go to sort of all round earth? No, I use the normal, normal the polyurethane. Normal, polyurethane, one. yeah. I've always yeah. used the polyurethane, but I, I actually mix matte mat and satin 50 50. So I do in, in one of my big. I don't find that the matte one's that matte, the poly. It's, yeah, but I, yeah, it's not. Um, it's not nowhere near as matte as obviously like an, an ultra matte or like the Mecca, but but I like the way that the old purity seal rattle can used to look. It had, it's, it's kind of like somewhere in between matte and satin. So you've got a little bit of sheen, but it does have like a matte matte-ish kind of finish now obviously i'm not a big fan of the cans uh, can varnish because you get that marbling sometimes you don't shake it enough and like it's just i don't really rate aerosol 
uh, varnishes personally. I've never tried any aerosol varnishes for mini painting stuff. I've used it for like other DIY projects and whatnot, but from what I've heard, it's something that I've... Yeah, I've had, some, I've had some bad experiences previously and I'm sure anyone watching this has probably had a bad experience with one misting up or whatever. Blah, blah. I mean, even airbrush varnish can be a... It can be, yeah. Be I think the, 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 the level of risk is less with an airbrush, but but yeah, I've just got one of my ketchup bottles mixed uh, with... with <laughs> you and your ketchup yeah, bottles. Yeah, I have. I've got one mixed with 50% thinner, so it's half of it's thinner. 25% satin, 25% matte. And that's what that's what I use as a mix. Um, like 25 matte, 25 satin, and 50% thinner. Um, Adam, me, we, we in the office, we use a very similar sort of varnish. So we, we just call it matting because it's like half matte, half satin, oh, basically. Right. So, so we use that all the time. Um, and it's very similar to the old classic purity seal in the way that it looks, um, which is which is quite good. Um, so yeah, so so yeah, but that overall, the AK the AK Ultra Matte is 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 a phenomenal phenomenal varnish. It's really good. Do you want to uh, fire off something else here? You so got, you're going to get a lot to get through. <laughs> so yeah, so to condense it down, you're going to get five for the price of two. Five for the price of two. Everyone knows that classic saying. When yeah. you walk into the supermarket, what five, do they five, always say? Five, five, five they always the, say five for the price of two. Five for the price of two. So, uh, so this that I'm going to get some of the some of the older paints out of the way first. So, I'm a huge lover of the old uh, Gaines Workshop uh, metallics. Um, going to start. How with, old? <laughs> no, well, it's been around a long time, but the, but this is the this, this is the last iteration of the of the pot that they used to do. So, the good old bolt gun metal. How is that different to the current pots? Uh, it's different. It hasn't got the hasn't got the quick quick release bit on the on the. It's basically the same. It, right? It's basically basically the same. Like you know, essentially the same. Um, but uh, but yeah, like it's basically the same. But um, but bolt gun metal, the old metallics, they are like silk. They the 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 the, the micro flakes in them are tiny, um, and I I just find lead belcher personally for me as an opinionated statement. I find it a little bit thicker, a bit chunkier. Um, this, like the old metallics, like my, the the three that I'll say are bulk of metal. I've then got my absolute favourite. This is my, this is probably bold statement. This is probably my favourite metallic paint ever. Is the old Citadel Chainmail? I don't think I've ever even seen that one. I love Chainmail. It's so good. Like it is uh, uh, literally amazing. Um, so they're the, the kind of two metallics that I use. So the way I said about getting extra value for listeners is that um, is that like. Uh, if you can't get those, the Vallejo, uh, the Vallejo Air Range, mm-hmm. the the gunmetal is not, it isn't the same, but it's the closest that I've found to bolt gunmetal because right. it flows really well. Is that the one that's in like the pot, like the air ones? It's in a dropper bottle. You'll love it. Oh great! Um, yeah. So so and those other ones are good as well. The metal, the air metallics in the bigger pots, they are good as well. But the but the chain mail, the the gunmetal in the dropper bottle or even the, the airbrush pot one, that is also very, 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 very good. Um, and then obviously for chain mail, there's, I think there's one called aluminium. I think it is. Yep. Aluminium is very similar to chain mail. Chain mail's, chain mail's got more of a bluish hue to it. When you look at it, um, it when, when it's, if, if you leave it for long enough and it separates on a palette, it's, it's got, got like that blue ink. It's, sort of in in yeah. it. it's really, really good. Um, so that, they're from my, my, some of my favorite metallics that I always tend to use. So it's always bulk gun metal shade. And I always shade it with like 950 black, like watered down. So you get a nice matte kind of metallic kind of finish. Um, and then I'll highlight with chain mail. And then this is where you get the bonus, the Brucey bonus. So Pro Acryl, everyone's been raving about Pro Acryl recently. So I got some to try out because I was like, I'll give them a go. Cause I, you know, I've I, not I, tried them yet. Yeah. So I straight away have wanted something. So like with a lot of the acrylics that we do, we always do like dot highlights on corners and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was reaching a point where I was highlighting metallics and I was struggling to be able to do the dot highlights. You're running out of, uh, running out of brightness. Running out of brightness, (laughs) yeah. So uh, I then- That looks to me immediately like the scale color speed metal from a a distance. So this is, is- it's Pro Acryl Metallic Medium. So that's what it is. So it is a metallic paint. Oh. However, however, this is designed to basically add, to mix. add in, yeah, add in to make things have a fleck. I've not seen this. This is so, brilliant. So this is amazing. Okay. So you can make any like metallic color, basically. You can make lots of metallic colors. Yeah. Which is great. Uh, as a as a as a specific uh, that's what the tool is so it's great so if you want to make a metallic color that you're unsure about like pro acryl uh, and we'll do some photos so you can have a look at the pots and stuff um, but metallic medium is great for that but where it really shines to use the oh pun uh, snuck that in um, is uh, is 
for my corner dots on, on, on chain mail, like when you look at the saturation and the colors next to each other, and again, we'll take a photo so you can see, uh, this thing is like uh, a bright white searchlight on the, on the horizon. It's so, it's so, <laughs> it's so, it's so vibrant. So I literally, my, my process for dim metallics is literally bolt gun metal, shade it, um, do my highlight, do my highlight stage with chain mail. And if you want to do several stages of highlighting on metallic, you get your metallic medium and you, you mix, it in. mix it into your chain mail as a 50 50 stage. And then right. it, it's, it's There's layers to this onion it is phenomenal. So that's kind of like a, a bit of a, that's the four out of five. What do you mix with it for? Like, say you're going to do like a color, like say you're just going to do alpha lesion or something. Put ink in it. I was going to say, would you put ink in it? Or would you put acrylic in it? Yeah, because in it? if you put ink in it, what happens is it, it, it retains the metallic pigmentation. And what actually happens is that you get, uh, you get a metallic paint, but t- toned. So you could get your, red ink mm. drop a bit into that and you'd make the most amazing vibrant red metallic i like this we're, yeah. we're crossing our uh, we're crossing the streams, crossing the streams like streams. ghostbusters <laughs> yeah uh, so that's really good but but just for, for for listeners as well we want to give as much value on the podcast as possible for you and like the thing is is there's a really good scale 75 metallic set um which has essentially got all different tones of metallics now you could theoretically make those using the the, the procrural medium with with like a, different inks or even contrasts or things like that um, so yeah, so that's kind of like the, the, the metallics that I wanted to bring to the table, but there are, there is another one, which, which is probably one of my favorite metallics ever, like absolutely ever. I've got a feeling it's going to be an old one, James. It is an old one. Yeah. But I've, I've, I've brought, I've brought a little new a bit of modernity. I've brought something that's very similar. Um, so tin bits. And if anyone's watching this who remembers Tin Bits, it is such a good paint. Tin Bits sounds like if you was in like the Warhammer universe, that would be like a kid's morning TV show, like For the Orcs. Potentially, yeah, that, that, that could work, yeah. That could <laughs> it's work. like a Saturday morning yeah. cartoon. We're not doing a parody. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, but no, um, Tin Bits is phenomenal. And I, and I absolutely love it. For when I'm doing like um, metals and metallic, so let's just say like there's a case example. If I'm doing like Golden Armor or whatever, I will... Uh, use this as my, my deep shadow color. So it's got this really lovely, got like almost golden copper kind of tone to it. But it's, is that, is that sealed? Uh, no, it's, it's, I've got to see this. It's, it's, We're doing this live on air. It's live on air. Yeah. So I can't so, let the air get to it for long, George. Come on. Come on. Come <laughs> I've on. got like a time limit. You've got a time limit. It's like countdown. Din, din, din. I'm not going to do the sound thing. It's very dark. It's very it? dark. It's like yeah. charcoal. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. So make sure that's on tight, George. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, uh, but like Timbits is one of my favorite, favorite old paints. Like, I don't know how you describe that color. I'm, I'm baffled. It's like purpley, but it's also dark. So when you let it separate, it's got, it's got a bit of purple pigment in it, which I absolutely love. And incidentally, that ties really good to, uh, another of the old ones, which I absolutely love, which is brazen brass. So brazen brass, um, uh, has got a lot of purple hue in it. And as it moves and shimmers, you've got this lovely etheric kind of purplish kind of hue to it. But Timbits does trump it a little bit. It's so, kind so. of like Balthasar Gold, but a lot darker. It's better. It's no, way, no, no, but I mean, in terms of like better. closest thing I can think of, it's like a darker Balthasar Gold. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's like a darker Balthasar Gold for those of you that use the, the modern uh, GW range quite a lot. Um, but fear not, because I have got a backup for that if you can't get hold of Timbits. Um, I love that your loophole for being able to recommend old paints is just recommend an equivalent that isn't as good. It's not that it's not as good. It's just, it's just, I understand it's harder to get hold of. I get that totally. So, uh, scale color, scale I'm color. you've won me over James. George's, George, I'll take it back. George's I'll take it back. Hooked, George's hooked like a kipper. Um, so, uh, so the, uh, the best equivalent that I, that I found and that I was recommended to by various people uh, before I managed to buy up the last remaining stock of Timbits in existence, hopefully. Uh, is, <laughs> is, uh, is, if you're uh, trying to buy some Timbits and someone's outbidding you, it's probably James. It's probably me, yeah. Um, it is uh, Decayed Metal from Scale 75. Like, it is... It's not the same as in it's not got the dark, it's not exactly the same darkness of, 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 of colour, but Decayed Metal from Scale 75 um, is a phenomenal paint. And if you are looking for something very similar to Timbits, Decayed Metal is the way to go. It's great for doing like bronze kind of things. If you're looking to do statues or scenery, it's amazing to put that on. Um, you know, if you want to make a very close equivalent to to Tim Bits, a little bit of black into decayed metal, and you're very, very, very close. Um, yeah, it's a it's a phenomenal, a phenomenal paint. So there you get five metallics for the price of two. So, so yeah, it's, I, it's, it's I don't know that that's in the spirit of 
of the show, but I'll let it go. Excuse me, you did I'll this. You did this on the last paint episode. You brought the you brought the royal, oh, fam- yeah, royal family of scale. <laughs> so so, and by that you mean I brought like one extra paint. You've got an array here. Yeah, I know. Um, right, go on then. What are your greens? My greens. Uh, so again, I like I like very old scorpion green. So that's one of my very favourite old paints. Uh, why why that one? Because it has. A very, very, it's got the perfect yellow green balance for when you're doing like final highlight stages on like green lenses, green gems, all those kind of things. It's a really, really, it like, I always find that I'm needing to put a little bit more ice yellow or a little bit more of a really. I mix with mood green normally. Yeah, yeah. So, like, and put something in it to boost it. For example, like, Scorpion Green has just got like the perfect, the perfect vibrancy. It's just like, it's, it's really good. Um, you know, and, and again, a lot of the older paints do have a very high saturation of color because they do come from that era where it was, things were always very bright if that makes sense mm. um so so again really good paint if you still got it i always I, I would always say probably use that over some of the more modern brighter greens that are out there and like when you do hold it up next to like sort of other paints like you know if you look for example um from 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 vallejo we've got the equivalent color which i'm going to recommend which is escorpina from vallejo game color which again is a really really good green um the scorpion just just is slightly more saturated as you'll see hopefully on camera and it's very close it's it's very close yeah it's a very 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 close that i mean escorpina in spanish essentially means scorpion uh scorpion green so um so it's very close but it is a little bit more desaturated just a tiny bit. Mm. Um, but the good thing is... I bet you could mix a bit of ice yellow in that, though. You can, which is the thing that I do. Or the extra little bonus, the little Brucey bonus paints that we've got. You've got Livery Green, which is the next uh, next colour in the range, is a really good booster if you want to boost that brighter. Because that's like a bit past. It's, it's like, past, It's yeah. like the previous it's, one is a bit it's, darker and that one's a bit brighter. Yeah. So your Scorpion's are great bridging, kind of the gap. bridging the gap, but the Livery Green is great. But if you do want to boost even even higher... My, the actual paint I wanted to bring to this, which is the one that I use all the time for like when I'm doing green gems, green lenses, or if I'm doing final dots on it, green armor, like things like that, is uh, yellow green for model color. And obviously, because it's model color, it's a lot of very dense pigmentation being obviously the model color paint that it is. <laughs> I love Vallejo's just no nonsense naming schemes. Yellow green. That's what it is. Like, what should we call it? It's a bit yellow. It's a bit it's green. Not, it's not we'll ye- call it yellow green. It's not yellow. We'll call it yellow. And it's not green. <laughs> It's yellow green, so 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 yeah. Um, but it's it's brilliant. Absolutely love it. Uh, and it's it's like if you're looking to do like dot dot highlights on like green armor, like the, the on your like dark angels or like on uh, whatever the case may be that's got green armor. Like it's it's really really good. Um, so yeah. So if you can get scorpion green, I recommend it. Cause it's a really good paint. Uh, if not, then that triad uh, of uh, of escorpina. Livery green and then yellow green from Vallejo will uh, will fill your boots basically. Do you find you get burned a lot when you buy uh, the old paints online, or do you have pretty good success rate with that? Um, it varies. I ask uh, that they, they, you, a lot of people will have photos of, of, the, of what it's like, so that, that does happen quite a bit. You do get to see a bit of a photo of how it's actually uh, how it is actually in the pot. But yeah, I've been I've 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 bought job lots before, and out of twenty paints, there's only been two that have been alive. You know, it's a uh, you know, but I, I but. I think that's it's part of the luck of the draw, really. Like it's what makes it a bit fun, you know. Is that like the fun? The thrill yeah, because you get like, oh my god, the tin bits is like brand new, or like oh oh, it's it's drier than the Sahara, you know. So like it it just you're playing like Russian roulette with your paints. Like you, your order comes in the mail and you're all excited and you open it up. It's because you can't go down to the shops anymore and get them, obviously. Yeah. Like you know, but like yeah, like uh, part for me, that's part of the fun of it as well. It's like you know, being able to find an old paint that's still really usable is is, is great because like it's like number one like. A biggest tip I, I, I advise is obviously just in general for paints. As this episode is quite, quite obviously about paints, quite a lot. Like I, I see a lot of people that literally just open the pot while they're painting and leave the pot open. Mm. That's horrendous for the paint. Like it's horrendous leaving, it, especially if you're quite a oh pot. for the paint. Yeah, like as in you leave the pot, the pot open while you're painting. So you take the pot out, yeah, you open yeah. the palette, and then you just leave the lid open. Like I think like that's one of my golden rules when I'm painting. And if I don't, it's something that I've always done. Like I, I've always got the paint out of the pot, close the pot, made sure it's sealed. And and a lot of pots get left open. I love that dry. that you're not like worried about their models. You're like the poor paint. <laughs> yeah, I know. I do. I, I do. I do. Yeah, especially when you can't. Get- I really <laughs> thought you were going to say like, oh, and they leave the pot open, and I see them getting paint from the pot, and they're going to ruin the models. You're like, no, you're just concerned about, I'm concerned about the paint. If they, wanna, if they want to, yeah, if they want to put it straight on a model, then fair. But no, but like, uh, yeah, but like, I, I just, yeah, I think, um, yeah, you have got to look after your paints as well as anything else. It's like anything that like we say, like you know, 
it, it, they're going to dry it if you leave the lid open. Um, and uh, and yeah, like, especially when you're using older paints that you can't get you can't get as easily. Like if you if you do that, you just well, you just, that's that's why, of course, I put all of my paints into a dropper bottle. One of the dropper bowls. Yeah, I know. You, I've got here. Uh, this is a spicy one, James. I've got the correct color for a base rim, and that is still Legion Drab. Okay, right in the comments right now. If you're watching this, get a comment in: black base rim or steel legion drab or brown base rim. What do you prefer and why? Put it in the comments. We need to. We, we, everyone who's on team black base rim, you need to get a comment in now because that that steel legion drab. As much as it looks, please good tell on, us why you're wrong. <laughs> if you uh, if you like a black base rim, as much as as much as uh, as as much as uh, um, it looks good on the box art, definitely. Um, I just have always personally preferred me and Peachy had this we had this conversation where it was like you know he prefers about racing but I will still argue the fact that if you do handle your models by the base which is the correct model etiquette if you're gaming um, I couldn't care less about like scratching the paint off or chipping the base rim I don't like most of my bases that I do and most bases that you see are like ground cover they are natural elements yeah I, you don't see black like unless, there, unless it's like asphalt like fair enough, but that's man-made. Like, there's no natural like brown that's going to contrast. With the, it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense to me. You can. I don't. I don't like that the model, and then it's got like the nice basing on it, and then you've got this harsh line of like the black. I want it to blend in. That's because the base, the base room is like the base room is like. Right. Um, think about it this way, right? When you cut a cake open, yeah. Right. It's not the color of the icing on the inside, James, is it? It depends. You might put a layer of icing in there. Oh, give me a break. Right. <laughs> It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's distracting. So I'm thick, not into so it. When you have a big thick layer of icing on top of the cake and you cut through it, it's got at least like half an well, inch. I like of... to imagine that it's like the cross section of the earth. Oh, right? I want yeah. it to like blend in. Nah, but it's a frame. It's a frame. It's a frame for the base of the model. No, so, not having it. Yeah. Not having so, it. Yeah. You know, so, I especially don't it, like it. I especially don't like it when the model is a black scheme or it's got a lot of black in the model or it's a dark model. Yeah, I, maybe potentially. Team, team black base rim. Back me up in the I comments I actually now, saw please. someone in the comments crying that the uh, the new Striker Scorpions have black base rims. Mm. I mean, that, that would have been way too much green. It would have been way too much green, but never mind. What's what's your what's what's what else do you like about it? Is that is that purely? Is it just for base rooms? Is that all you like it for? Um, yeah, feel feel empty. The spot was that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, it's pretty much just base rooms. Uh, I mean, it's a good color. It's, it's brown. I it? like it for leather. I think leather is is quite. Good. I don't use it in like many of my leather recipes. Not from like lack of it being good for that it's just I think it's a really good colour because what you often see is a lot of people just paint all the leather the same brown mm. I think sometimes especially if you've got like maybe not so much sci-fi maybe more like sort of like fantasy or like D&D &D models when you've got like different colour like warmer richer browns normally it's quite yeah. it's desaturated it's quite desaturated yeah. Uh, yeah. it's mostly used for base rims if I'm being honest but it's, yeah. it's it will be good enough for, for anything else yeah yeah. probably use it as like a highlight stage if I was going to do it for leather but it'd have yeah. to be quite pale yeah yeah if you're enjoying this episode of Paint Perspective, I just wanted to ask that you could please do us a huge favor and leave us a rating or review on whatever platform you're using. It would really, really help us out. And please also choose to follow or subscribe. It allows us to continue to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the show. Well, my next one is absolutely leagues away from that in, in, <laughs> in contrast. Um, uh, I've always struggled to find really decent oranges, like a really good saturated orange that... Um, it's punchy when it dries, it doesn't desaturate too much. Um, and, uh, it's a, it's a paint, which it's, it's, well, it's named red highlight, but, but, um, Kador red highlight from P3. P3. Yeah, I know. It's I a wild bring, card, isn't it? I know. It? I'm bringing out, bringing out all the golden oldies here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really good orange. Can you still get that? I'm not hundred percent sure if you can or not. Uh, you'd have, you'd have to correct me if I am wrong on that, but. Yeah, no, it looks like you can, you can still get it. Yeah. So I wanted to do like a prisoner army, like from from forty k, and um, and uh, obviously orange jumpsuits are pretty pretty the in thing I've heard in, in sort of prison colonies guy kind of armies. Well, like stuff. a necromunda kind of yeah, thing. yeah, kind of. I wanted to do something a little bit like that. Um, so finding a really good orange uh, to to sort of uh, remain vibrant, obviously for the jumpsuits, um, whilst obviously being able to edge it with a slightly brighter color, but covering really well. Um, yeah, P three P three K or red highlight is. is I'm not familiar with the range, so it's highlight. Is that part of the paint formula, or is that just the name of the? No, color? it's just the name. So, okay. so it's just a. You've got Cador Red, uh, and then you've got this as a as, as a highlight. Right. Okay. I thought so, it might be like the Citadel layer based. No, situation. no, no. It's just done. It's just done so that uh, so that it's like a highlight color, if that makes sense. Uh, as in, like it's a brighter, brighter gotcha. version. But the name is literally just highlight. So, um, so yeah. But I, I I really rate this orange. Like I actually went from just using it to do a couple of testers for Army, which never actually. I made all the models, spent ages making them, and then just when you look at a hundred conscripts you're like uh maybe not um 
but then I actually started using it to uh, to, to edge uh, red armor quite a lot, like for some of the higher stages. And then this with ivory. What but, would you be doing red armor for? Um, just just a little little known chapter. Um, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but but um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna sit there and um, and, uh, and and bang on about it for ages. But uh, but yeah. So so essentially um, so essentially. Yeah, I use this all the time for edging reds, capes. Um, it's really good with a brush. Like it goes on really well with a brush. It covers quite well. Um, yeah, it's really good for for doing lots of lots of uh, myriad of different um, of different uh, sort of highlight stages and bits and bobs like that. Um, but if you're looking for a really good orange that covers really well, it's great for the airbrush. Dilutes really well. It's quite matte in finish as well, which is quite nice. Um, then yeah, P3 uh, Kador Red Highlight is is is. And you found that why is that different to other oranges that you've tried? Just because it's really saturated, like it's really really bright, and and like often a lot of paint ranges, the scope of the the scope of the um, the, the the oranges in like a range will be quite the the, the jumps will be quite substantial, um, and towards the brighter end of the spectrum, you only really end up with like maybe one or two, which which are really really good. Kador Red Highlight for me is is a really really vibrant color that you can always boost again with ice yellow but at the same time it's it's great for just blocking in color well um a lot of oranges i find to block in if you're looking at jacara orange from citadel it's very desaturated like it's not got a high high saturation at all whatsoever um yeah i would i would definitely rate rate it as, as that kind of color okay well speaking of saturated got uh got another classic of mine uh this is I never know what to call this this is the Vallejo fluorescent green. Um, I think there's a couple like in a similar range. This the is the one that's like literally UV reactive. The fluoro range. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like this. A couple of specific things. Plasma and lenses. And this. Never used it. This in conjunction with this. It's a good little match. So, 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 so do you put like white on first and then. Yeah. And then. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder it's, what it is. Uh, the consistency is horrendous being honest it's very thick not in a good way it's kind of like it's usable it's quite jelly so you've got to go in, it goes over white great right you want to thin it down a lot and kind of build up the layers but that's kind of why it works so well because like obviously the more white that you're showing underneath the brighter the color is yeah yeah yeah. and it airbrushes like fantastically over white yeah um i used to use trick i used to do with like the blood angel that i did because i really like the 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 stark contrast because you got such a punchy like bright red yeah, yeah and having that contrasty like punchy bright green and this is like so great for like the, those like quick and easy like lighting effects and whatnot yeah if I, so if you like doing it, these on like a lens on like a model with with that red ink like it stands out it looks really powerful and yeah. you can literally just do like a black uh eye like lens on a helmet yeah you can just sort of put a wash in there of white so you've got that sort of like tint over the middle where oh, it pulls get, in the bottom oh, right, okay. and then, and then you go in with the, with the green black yeah and then you go wow. in with the green Sorry. And you sort of glaze it in and you've got that really nice like bright white line. Looks like they're glowing. So easy. Yeah, yeah. Seconds. Takes seconds to and do. And they, they do fluoros in lots of different colours, don't they? They do yellow, yeah. they do orange, they do pink, I think, don't they? As yeah. well. The is, orange there, is there one, a purple? There's a few. The orange one well, is okay. Magenta. The orange one is okay. The blue is pretty crap, being honest. I haven't I've not I've, I've it, got two of them, but they're I've not just used like them. because they're fluorescent and they're UV reactive, like I are you are they UV reactive yeah, as well? I didn't realise that. Yeah, so if you like want to have if you want to have a rave with your with your warhammer armor, you can put on a black light. I thought the the fluoro dictated that it just it. I know it sounds it obviously stands for fluorescent, but mm. I didn't realize that it was UV. I didn't realize. I yeah, you shine, you shine like a UV light on this. They're, they're glow. Yeah. Right. Okay. I didn't realize that. Oh, like only under the black light. It's not like glow yeah, dark. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I, didn't I think it. it's just a like a physics thing of like some fluorescent colors just work better than others. I don't think yeah. it's necessarily a problem with the paints. Yeah. 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 Um, the green works fantastic, and then my second favorite probably the orange. But I don't really use that for much, being honest. Okay. This for like plasma effects, lenses, like anything like that. Just so a small little. Pop. You said there's a blue one. Like, is it like a dark blue? Is it like a light blue? Is it like? It's not dark. It's not bright either. It's just sort of a, a mid a mid tone blue that you you sort of expect sort of like like this sort of color on like the okay. blue orange helmet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just not that bright, being honest. Like, I don't really understand. I've, I've not found that it being fluorescent is of benefit to that blue. Yeah. Um, but with the green, like using this. It's a different effect at the end of the day. Yeah, like, you, well, you can really see at the bottom of the pot. Like, yeah, the, yeah, when it separates that, out. That yeah. is crazy, the difference in the bottom of the pot to the top. Yeah, it needs a good shake, but... Uh, yeah, that is, yeah, that is crazy how bright that is. Yeah, they're yeah. fun to use, though. Like, it, they're they're pretty affordable as well. Um, yeah, well, they're, they're, and it does, it's a model colour, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. I didn't know if it was a model colour or not, but yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't use it for, like, painting a model. I'd use it for, like, a plasma gun, 
like glowing lens, maybe like a some other weapon effect, like in or you know, like a jetpack or something. Fair, like, whatever, yeah. whatever you want to use it for, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, fair. It's up to you. Even on fantasy stuff, I guess if you had like a wizard or doing some sort of something glowing fire in a hand, I don't know. But yeah. anything like that, I think it works well. Less is probably more. No, of course, yeah. I think with anything like that, you don't want it to look like you, you, you're a disco or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, so. it works especially well when you've got like really heavy contrast. So if you've got like a darker scheme yeah. or a darker model, or it's used in shadow, uh, then it really punches through. Yeah, good kit. That can't find anything else that has might replace it because it's, it's a pretty unique product. Yeah. I have to give them a try. Like I said, I've got two of them sitting on my shelf and I'm li- I've literally never used the fluoro paints. Just haven't used them. Just put it on your, your little painting journal. Just put it in there. I have to give it, give it a swatch in my book. Yeah. It'll be glummy. It'll be like that scene, but in green out of Indiana Jones where he's yeah, exactly. it. It'll be like, yeah. Um, so what yeah. you got for us? I have two paints, but it's for one entry. Um, we we always get, I'm offering value here, George. We have five for two and now we've got two for one. Two for one, yeah. Deals are getting better. <laughs> I'm not or, sure that or worse. Or worse. It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the deals are getting worse. Yeah, we're not getting five for three or five for two. We're getting two for one now. But it's, it's still a very, very good deal. It's a very, very good deal. Uh, we always get asked about white and uh, the best way to paint white. Um, I think one of the bigger problems that a lot of people do struggle with when it comes to white is, is like... Um, is is being able to uh, to highlight it, and I think the big prob- the trick to paint white is not paint white. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you can. Yeah, um, like I think a lot of whites uh, in in many ranges of paint. And it's not inherently like a specific manufacturer or anything like that. There aren't like lots of whites mm. to choose from, and they all tend to have the same vibrancy or saturation. They tend to all be in and around the same sort of point when you think of just white, if that makes sense. Um, so for me, one of my favorites um, it is a, uh, well, it's a combination of two, as I mentioned. So you're getting two for the price of one here. But to block in white, a lot of people will go with a very bright, stark white to start off with. The problem with that is that then, yes, you can th- obviously shade that. You can add various degrees of shading to white and add contrast onto the model really nicely. But it's all the parts that you want to be brighter or show where the light is catching. Once you've gone to that, that bright white for your main white when you put it on first also the brighter the white like the thicker the paint just inherently because like the pigment is bigger yeah I, yeah i think I, when you see a lot of like gobby textured models it's on white especially like white is especially prone to that i think that's why it's got the, the negative stigma that it has um but I, I think that again like trying various different brands and manufacturers you'll find one which which is more suited to the way you paint or what you're looking for etc um so I've got two for you, which are my staple when it comes to painting any form of white at all whatsoever. Um, so I always base paint uh, base paint uh, models with uh, with a paint called uh, White Grey. So you can get this as a... Again, Vallejo, a banger of a name that. Yeah. White what gray. should we call it? Should we call it like ethereal white? Should we call it's it not like... Gray. White? It's, it's not white. It's not white. It's not white. It's not quite white. White, white, white gray. gray. Yeah. So uh, 71.119 White Grey. That is the air version of it there is a uh, model color version of it that is thicker and not designed to go through the airbrush is that the same paint like the model color one yeah it, the tone is exactly the same well the colors are really the same i prefer this because when i'm painting wings on the certain red chapter uh and i'm painting them white uh I, this is the color that i use to block them in with to start off with um because and this is my white main base color basically um, you don't use that through the brush though right yeah i do yeah. Oh, okay. Brushing a hair dry. It, it dries super, super. Do you not find it's too thin to work with? Nope. Covers, okay. covers like a dream. It's really good. Okay. Um, I find that the model color version, which is more designed for brush work with a, with a, with a thicker pigment or more thicker pigment, more pigment. Um, I find that that, um, that, that tends to, that tends to, uh, create more of a texture when you're working it quite, quite, quite rigorously trying to get white on the surface. So once you've base coated it with this, you can shade it with whatever color you want. Obviously, if you're going for a cooler color, you might use blues, you might use purple, you might use a mix of purple and, purple and blue. If you're going warmer, you might use grays, etc. cetera. Um, but when it comes to highlighting that, the beauty of it, and this is where the real, it has its real virtue, is that I use probably one of the brightest whites I've found through various whites that I've uh, purchased and tried and then stopped using because they're not bright enough. Um, which is uh, cold white, which is a model color. Uh, model color cold white, really good. Seven zero point nine one nine. So is that not quite white again? This no, this is this is super bright. 
this is like when you look at it. So if you compare the white gray and the and so how does that com- cold white compare to just a normal? Was it nine five one? It's white? brighter, even brighter. It's brighter. Yeah, yeah. You can put it on the palette, and they are brighter. Have you got one here, George? No, amazing. Let's do let's do an, an on camera test uh, and see what they're like. Yeah, I've used it several times, and uh, it is super. So see if I can get any out of it. The end's dried. Uh, See, Dropper bottles are really good, George, aren't they? Like well, the, end, see, the, end, the end dries and then you have to lift, lift Well, if you look after out. your paint bottles, then you don't have this problem, James. Yeah. See, I had with me... I no, was, already I can see it's brighter and I'm just looking. I was considering whether to suggest uh, 951 white because that's one of my favourite whites, but I went, oh no, I've already got five paints. No. I'll have to substitute it, one out. Give it here. But if you're on. in here bringing like 30 paints in... Give it, give it here. Go on then, what we got? You, that's got... You can't say that's not brighter. Yeah, it's brighter, yeah. It is vibrant as hell. It's really good. There, there I was assuming that white was the ceiling of white. It's not. But Vallejo so what, were there what with we'll cold do, white. What we'll do, I'll hold these up so you can see them next to each other. So the cold white is at the top here and the uh, whatever other white is. The, 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 it's just called white. Just, just, <laughs> just, just, just called white. The white is here. But we'll do, a, we'll do a photo on screen and put it on screen so you can see and we'll show you just how, how, how much more vibrant the cold white is. It's, it's really good. So the, the beauty of the cold white is because it's so saturated in colour and so bright. What it does for you is it allows you to put on crisp kind of edge highlights on white armor really, really well. And especially if you shaded down your 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 white and if you've if you've like sort of pin shaded bits and bobs. But cold white is is the one to go for. And using white gray air or white gray uh the model color, if you want to use the model color, and then highlighting it with cold white, it's it's the way to go, definitely. Um yeah, it's a phenomenal duo of white that you can that you can use to your heart's content and paint lovely white armor. I'm a bit sad now. I've been thinking this whole time that the white hat was as bright as it got. Nope. It's colder, so it's whiter. It's colder, so it's whiter. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, right. I've got my last one. What have you got? I've got, uh, I don't know if this is a classic or not, uh, Citadel Shade, Caraberg Crimson. Why I like this, right? Big ups, Matt Kennedy, friend of the show. He showed me using this as a recess shade on gold. Yeah, man. Good Lord. Yeah. That is the way forward. It's great. I I didn't really get... The coloured washes from Citadel didn't really get much of a look in from me previously. I don't know so, why, George, because they're phenomenal. Well, I say previously. I mean, like, I'm going back a fair bit now, but, you know, you've got your Nuln Oil, you've got your Agrax, Seraphim Seep, whatever, because they're so, like, usable on so many colours. Whereas... I guess in my mind, I was like, oh, like Caraba Crimson, like that's only used for shading red, right? But using this on golds for like a second stage of shading, I normally do a uh, like shade of like Reichland over or something like that. And then I'll use this in very, very thinned down either glazes or very, very carefully applied into like the deepest recesses on models. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely phenomenal. It has this like extra depth, but it keeps the richness of the gold. Mm-hmm. I'm going to jump in. Mm. So... Shading gold armor with Reichland because it's got that reddy, orangey, mm-hmm. browny kind of hue. Looks really great when you do that as the deep shade color. Mm-hmm. As in, like you can even mix that half with Reichland to mm-hmm. boost the Reichland into a bit more of a reddy hue, and then you do the tiniest, deepest parts just with that. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, really, yeah. yeah. So you, what I'm saying is, you add another stage. So you, mm-hmm. you, you, you do Reichland as you normally would. You do a half and half as like the in between shade between the soft and the, and the deep, so it transitions a bit, a bit smoother. And then you use that in the absolute tiniest depths on its own, just literally tiny little bit. And it just forces the eye and the visualization of the shadow into that recess a bit more. It's really good. Yeah. I mean, it's quite like a, it's quite a dark red, sort of like burgundy almost sort of color. You can um, use it with, um, what's the purple one? Magos purple? No, the shade, not the contrast. Oh. Um, Drucci. Drucci Violet. Drucci, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Drucci Violet and that is also great. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'll have to experiment on that because that seems the way. For, I mean, like the contrast of kind of in this weird sort of spot with the Citadel range at the minute, where like one paint can be replaced by another in the sense of you've got the contrast range and you've got the shade range. I mean, obviously they're doing a similar job, but like with the new shades, yeah. now they're so much more similar to contrast. There's kind of an argument for if you're going to not use a wash as a wash and you're going to thin it down and use it for glazing, you could probably be using a contrast paint instead. I don't know. I haven't really got a. Uh, much experience either way or much of a preference either really I mean they've obviously got their own separate properties but yeah like starting to use stuff like this for for glazing has just been a bit of an eye opener for me I, I really love glazing metallics with the Citadel washes like for example uh, Sepia Reichland uh, Agrax um, 
and 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 Carisberg and and also Drew, uh, Drucci. I think all of those have really got a good place when it comes to glazing on. on I think as well, gold. like using like not just one of those, not just being like, right, I've got my gold and I'm going to shade it with Reichland, and that's the shading done. It's like you can do multiple stages. Of yeah, shading. yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah, even with the same paint, you could do like a as long as you're filling it down and diluting it first, you could do your first like sort of pass at the model to get like a softer well, stage. The beauty of them is every time you do a layer, mm. as in you do a, a little bit of a tint it increases the saturation of that hue. Mm -hmm. So you can, you're quite right. So imagine you had the top of like a, the arch of a foot, like an armored marine, for example, or your storm cast near the foot. And you've got that upside down U kind of shape. You can do one layer first and then on the lower side, you do second and then again and again, you force the eye to, and it just, each little pass just tones that that recess darker towards where the shadow would be, where night light is naturally coming from. So yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're, they have such a good use when it comes to shading. And obviously, if you gloss varnish as well, really helps obviously to just make the fluidity of the liquid, allow it to flow better on the surface of the model. Um, yeah, um, it's, fun, it's great. Cool. That's a lot, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's all of them. Yeah. Nice nice selection there. So you actually got, let's see how many we've got. We've got six, nine, 12, 15, 18. You've got 19 paints for 10. 19, pa 19 I mean, paints for the price of 10. 19 paints for the price of 10. That's a deal. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. If you're a fan of the podcast and want to support the show, then what better way than with our exclusive Siege Studios merchandise? We have a bunch of high quality apparel available, as well as an assortment of painting accessories and equipment to help you while you paint. Head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop to order now. Question of the week time. Uh, thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, if you are watching on YouTube, please leave a comment. Uh, if you're listening on audio platforms, then uh, head over to our Instagram, shoot us a DM or wait for the story that we uh, do every so often and you can submit your questions there. Uh, <laughs> Big Blue Luke says, uh, as a recently returning hobbyist, the idea of a painting journal is really interesting to me. Could you maybe go into what is in each of yours? I know paint swatches was mentioned. What else would you recommend? I'm going to chime in here quickly. Uh, you I bought one recently. I only just bought one recently. So I'm actually also keen to learn what you're putting in yours, James. I bought mine really because I needed some art paper to, to practice some 2D art. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm going to sort of do two birds, one stone here. I'm yeah, going to buy yeah. the art book. Knowing future tense, I'm going to start using it as a painting journal. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm keen to know what's, uh, what's in your painting journal, James. So I, I mentioned like when you... The best way for me to explain it is like specifically with the, the swatches. Um, you don't have visual access to all the paint in the pot in front of you all the time, if that makes sense, because they're sealed, they're on racks or they're in like a drawer or whatever the case may be. So formulating them into one place and having them on a, on a on paint swatch pages in the back with notes about each paint. So you write, you do the swatch, you write the manufacturer, how it finishes, as in, is it satin? Is it matte? Is it gloss? You know, what's the coverage like? You know, uh, but you can even write a little note of what you typically use it for, things like that. Just so it gives you a little, like, almost like a little bit of a recipe page where you've got all your different paint swatches and things like that. One of the real virtues of it is that, let's just say you you go on holiday and you, you're going to start a new project when you come back. You can take your paint journal with you and you can start basically planning the project because you've got your full paint range there with you. As a, in those swatches. Oh, okay. It's, it's really good. You know, I've been on holiday before whenever I've taken one, like, you know, and, and, and I've taken a journal with me and I might go, right, I'm going to start uh, Necron's Army. So, uh, you know, what what paints am I going to use? What what am I thinking? Am I going ceramic? Am I going metal? Am I going rusted? Am I going clean? Am I going... And you can start... Not thinking... just on holiday. I guess you can kind of sit in like a, a separate environment from your painting space. Like you can, you know, sit yeah, on the sofa exactly. with your book and just sort of... I think I think one of the things that we all... Because when we, do, we have our go-to, right, I'm going to paint silver, so I'm going to choose this colour going back to today, bulk gun metal and chain mail for me or whatever. Like, but I think that when you, when you have, imagine going into the library and each topic in each, on each shelf was, was one book. And that's the book that you constantly read for that specific thing. It'd be quite boring and it would give, wouldn't give you the opportunity of choice. And I think when you, when you do the swatch pages and you've got all your paints from your paint collection swatched out in tiny little one centimeter squares or little, little round circles or whatever with some notes next to it, it means that you just learn like a good painter, in my mind, it's not only about ability and the way that you paint and how consistent and precise you are. Your knowledge of paint as well is really important. That's something that I think can often be overlooked. So like the ability to go, right, I'm painting some leather. I need a black, I'm going to paint black leather. I know that leather is, is satin in finish. So you might always use 950 black as your black go-to black. So if you have like a black gun casing and you have a black pouch on the model, you might paint both those things with 950, but then the material that that item is made out of are completely different. So the way that they would be as a finish 
should theoretically be very different. So going, actually, I know Abaddon because I've got my pad and I've got my black paints in, uh, in an amalgamation of swatches. I know that 950 is matte, covers really well, but Abaddon black still covers fairly well and also dry satin in finish. If I'm doing a gun casing, I'll pick the 950. And if I'm doing leather, I'll pick the, I'll pick the Abaddon because then that way they, the finish property it takes that they're different materials and they look slightly different. Mm. So it, it starts teaching you about those paints and then it gives you a more uh, informed way of choosing specific paints to then emulate materials, which is a whole another layer of depth when it comes to your models. Um, so that's what the rear is. It's a swatch, a, a swatch pad and you can do like five, six, seven pages and you know, blah, blah. I really recommend you do it whenever you buy a new paint. One of the first things you do, put on the palette, brush, swatch, write the notes, leave it to dry, write the notes. You know, I, I think if you get in the habit of doing that, those pages will fill up very quickly at the back and you'll have five, six, seven, eight, nine sides. It doesn't have to be pages. You can do on each side, obviously. And you can have loads of sides. And that what that does is it's filling up that shelf in the library for you so that you can literally make informed choices for what you're painting and what it's trying to resemble and what the things are. And I think that's one of the things that's really important when it comes to that specific part of the painting journal. At the front, a project per page. So... We've all been there. I said it on a lot when it was mentioned in the previous episode, like you painted a specific army, you paint 2000 points, you, you follow a process, you forget half the paints, you try a new, next new cool model comes out. One of the Christmas boxes comes out and you're like, wow, I want to add that to my collection or to my army, blah, blah, blah. You forget half the paints that you've been done on your, on your first phase or the first set of the army. So being able to have a page in your painting journal that you can go, right, there's all my paints. And you can put swatches on those front pages as well that corroborate the ones that are in the back. You can put a swatch down and see all those colors in little swatches next to each other. If you're planning a new art, new color scheme, and you go, actually, that color doesn't work with that one that well. You actually get like a visual swatch kind of like matrix of, of colors. So you can see visually all the things that are going to be on that army, that new army that you're painting. And at that point, you can flick to the back, go, actually, I need a brighter green because that green looks a little bit dark when it's next to that orange or next to that red or blah, blah. And it allows you to flick between the front and the back and you can make some really informed choices without needing to put any paint on the palette at all whatsoever saving you time and a lot of time that we waste as painters is in choosing colors or in doing processes which are um, maximized for efficiency and for quality and you'll sit there for ages and just go right um you know i, I need a green okay well i always use caliban green but then i've got this other one that potentially covers better or finishes more satin which could emulate the thing the plant that i'm painting on there because it's got a bit more of a satin finish or whatever like it just helps you have a much more level of depth when it comes to the things that you're painting and informed choices for colors. I guess it also incentivizes you to use colors that you wouldn't normally use rather than just defaulting into your normal exactly, recipe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like you, you, your pre-programmed recipe, obviously there's a, there's a difference between a pre-programmed recipe because that's the color that you always use. And this is the color that I love using because it looks like this. That's a very, they're two very different things. That doesn't mean that like the color that you love and that you always use has to be the singular color that you use for that thing or for that process. You can always have other things that complement that, you know, and then that's really what the journal's for. Um, you know, it's, it's really good. You can, you know, you can write pages talking about your project. You can write notes to yourself about what you found hard notes to yourself about where you, you saw improvement in your painting. You know, it's really good if you're doing like high end pieces, you can write down, you can go through the normal process of planning the project, writing the colors down, writing what they're used for, blah, blah. And then you can put, put yourself notes next time it comes to using, using that or trying to do that technique or trying to do that. You can write yourself some notes that benefit you the next time you try and do it. Do you ever do anything like retrospective of like the end of a project, like writing down maybe things that you struggled with or things that you found that's, easy? That's what I'm something. talking about, yeah. the notes. Yeah, it yeah. really helps because then you could next up, because let's just say you have painted an army and let's just say um, you've done a specific technique on there and you've done a test model first and you oh, way overkilled it with a certain effect or a certain thing. Writing yourself a note on how you achieve that and the errors that you've made or the mistakes that you've made, the next time it comes to adding to that and you need to do the thing again, you'll read that and go, right, I know I need to be careful when I'm using this paint because last time I overclocked it too much or I done this or I done this. Yeah, because so I guess I, I paint quite a lot of models and I find that at the end of the process, I'll often have like loads of like feedback in my head in the sense of like things that I thought went well and things that, I, things that didn't. But before I know it, I'm onto the next model and I've long forgotten like yeah. by the time it comes around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's really helpful. Like, I, I massively, massively recommend buying one and using it. And as a, just as a final note to add on to that, buy a proper art book. I'm not talking a pad down WH Smith's or like from your, from your uh, stationary supplier. I'm talking a proper gray toned acrylic mixed medium pad or book. 
that ha- that is designed for painting with acrylics because the acrylics will bond to that paper way better than they will on, on a piece of paper that's got a bit of a satin finish and the paint will crack off after some time because obviously acrylic is plastic. Um, I said on a previous episode, like I picked one up recently. They're actually like way cheaper, more affordable than I thought. Yeah. I went to the range, got one. They're yeah. a few quid. Yeah. Yeah. Like just to get a proper art one, I can't, I can't push for that enough. Don't just go, don't watch this and just go buy a pad. Spend a little bit more. It is worth it. And it will last you a lot longer and serve you better as well. Hobby Hacks. This is our uh, weekly closing tradition uh, where we share a little hobby hack with you. Uh, if you have any hobby hacks yourself, please leave them in the comments. Uh, James, I believe you have one for this week. Yes, it's uh, it, it's it's a little bit, um, it's not so much a physical painting thing. It's more an equipment thing. So if you have a airbrush, if, you, if any of you that airbrush, I'm sure a lot of you do, um, if you have a compressor that's got a tank, which is the bit underneath that holds all the air that's got the sensor where it fills up, it cuts off, the, the motor cuts off when it fills up and then it, as it depletes, the motor engages, the, 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 the sensor engages the motor and it refills up the tank again. On the underside, there is a bolt on the underside. Oh, I know where this is going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so many moons ago, uh, uh, I discovered this bolt <laughs> and uh and uh undone it and found a load of rust and, and stuff that came out of uh, water i'm the, guessing yeah the water out of the tank so obviously oxygen has water in it or it has moisture in it it's o2 um uh we're back to change the science if you, if you <laughs> if you if you leave that in there even if you vacate all the air from the tank uh, at the end of a session if you leave that bolt in there any air that is left in there will condensate creating water um, it just uh, depends on the time of the year as well. Like if it's it humid, does, yeah. like you're, pulling, you're, 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 pulling, right. you're pulling air that is in the room and you're putting it into a small little tank and yeah. you're compressing well, it. You're compressing it, yeah. So it, uh, it, yeah. And that motor does heat up the tank as well. Exactly. Bear that in mind, it is, yeah. It's a two-stroke motor. It warms yeah. up. The, so what you're talking about is on the bottom of the tank, turn, there is, there's a little... Com- yeah, turn yeah. your compressor upside down. And on the underside of the tank, there's a... Normally it's brass. It could be silver. There's a there's like a, like a, a nut that under, unscrews. Get in the habit of taking that out at the end of a painting session. Obviously, use the dump valve on the side of the of the, of the compressor to vacate all the air or just take the line off so you can just get all the air out of it. Um, obviously, don't do that while it's full up with air. But that, of course, maximum pressurized. But that, of course, won't get any water out because that will sit in the bottom of the tank. Correct. So that nut, get yourself a bit of Blitz. Yeah, oh, cheeky, cheeky Blitz plug. Get yourself a bit of Blitz or really absorbent paper. Stick that underneath. Stick that underneath the the, the the compressor once you've taken that night out and leave it for like 15, 20 minutes. And what you'll find is when you come back is you'll find that you'll either have a very brown, rusty mark on the paper. Or if, or <laughs> we if, had we or had if, very <laughs> different experiences because I also discovered this uh, this little brass yeah. nut on the bottom. Um, I wouldn't say that Blitz would have been adequate. I would have needed a five gallon <laughs> bucket because yeah. I was thinking, oh, I, I was occasionally starting to get a bit of water spraying through my yeah. airbrush. Yeah. Like was not, when it was empty. I was like, oh, there must be a bit of, wa- a bad, a bit of water that's in there. That's a bad sign. Because the, the moisture trap I would empty. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, there must be a bit in there. I, I, I literally, it's like a comedy sketch. I've got it like upside down and I, like, I pull the valve thing off and it just just yeah. fires water out lovely brown out. browny orangey liquid Cu- yeah all yeah. rust all yeah. over your carpet yeah. yeah great um yeah so it can be quite bad i actually had so i i knew this for about a year or two and it was like many years ago when i was first started teaching and i went on a class uh i taught class and um on the first day i, I mentioned about the nut <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> and um one of the students was like oh yeah like i you know their, their moisture trap on their compressor literally looked like a tango swimming pool because it had oh. like, it as like it was like half of it was like sloshing with like this rusty. So oh, it was, he was going to take it out. He was going to undo it on, on uh, at that point when I mentioned it. I was like, please don't undo it. Like please <laughs> just just don't do it. Like do not do it. Um, and uh, on the day two, at the end of the day two class, he was like, oh yeah, I'm going to take that nut out before I go home. I was like, cool, yeah, okay, fine. It was so rusted that he couldn't get it undone with his hands. So he had like a pair, <laughs> he had like a pair of pliers. Um, put the pliers around this nut. Tried to undo it. Obviously, it gave some resistance. It went like that, and the whole entire plate around the nut came off. Oh, because it had rusted so much. Oh, yeah. yeah. So like, um, if you've never seen that bolt or the nut underneath a tanked compressor. I really recommend at the end of a painting session, use the red valve, dump valve on the side to get all the air out or take the, take the hose off at the, at the contact point of the compressor, take that off. 
and then and then obviously just get the paper paper towel and undo that bolt at the bottom of the compressor and i promise you like you can get that bolt put it on your desk put it in a little tupperware with your airbrush in some pieces after the session or whatever just so that you always remember to put that back in Obviously, if you don't put that nut, I think you can do it a bit more like periodically than that. I don't you think can you can do, do it like every single time. I'm, I'm, I'm all about building up, building up repetition and building up, building yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, you could make it like a weekly or monthly. Yeah. it's going to depend on your climate as well. Because like at the end of the day, if you if, if you're in the states, you're in like a really dry, yeah, yeah. dry hot state. You're yeah. not probably going to have this issue if you're no, in the UK where it's constantly wet. Yeah, then and it's obviously cold more of a concern. Damp. Yeah, yeah. I had once where my moisture trap was so full, I thought it was empty because it was clear. <laughs> It's not good, George. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah, but no, you've got to think of it this way. Those compressors, look, they're made, they're made, they make thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of them. They're not made from like state of the art, you know. No, they're the, still. The, the, it's it's yeah. still, it's going to rust quite easily. Like, you know, they're powder coated when they're sprayed. So like, they're not, they're not. I don't like, even know if they're powder coated on the inside. But No, they won't be on the inside. No. On the outside, they will be. But on the inside, it will just be the metal. So, so again, like that will rust very, very quickly. Maybe every day is overkill, but I definitely, if you get in that habit of taking that out at the end of a session, it's that, it's that first thing you do that, that at the beginning of the next painting session. And for the sake of bending down, putting it on, screwing it back up tight, it, it just, it will help that compressor last a lot longer. Just because you spent 50, 60 pounds, 60 bucks on it, whatever, blah, blah, just you spent a little bit of money on it. doesn't mean you shouldn't look after it, you know, and it will serve you a lot longer and you won't have a tango swimming pool in your, in your moisture <laughs> trap or, or make a massive stain on the carpet. So, so yeah, that's all my right. hobby hack for the week. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Well, and thank you all for listening to this week's episode of Pain Perspective. Uh, we will catch you on next week's episode. <laughs>